Hey there, in this video we are giving an introduction to advanced file handling, and this covers sections 12.1 to 12.2 in the Gaddis textbook. So file handling, incredibly important. You know, part of the reason why this is going to be useful at this time in our course is that our programs have started working with larger amounts of data. We're working with structures now, putting the structures in larger arrays. And now, as far as the testing regime goes, it's taking us more and more time just to type in a bunch of data to fill out those structures and all those arrays just to test whether our program is actually working correctly or not. So uh, it would be nice if we could get more efficient about that. And the more efficient thing to do if we're smart is to actually have all the data sitting on the hard drive or a USB in a file and have our program actually just loaded up automatically instantly uh, as the program starts up. And that'll save us time from doing a bunch of repetitive typing, which is exactly the kind of thing we don't want to do under the don't repeat yourself rule. So uh, hopefully this will help us uh, do that a little bit more efficiently. Now, the, the Gaddis textbook has a primer on file handling that's actually back at the end of chapter five. Um, so you might possibly look for my lecture on chapter five if you want an even easier introduction to this. Um, here in chapter 12, it kind of assumes that you saw that section, but hopefully this first video here will give you everything you need to know to get started if you didn't see um, uh, chapter five lectures. So here we go. Okay, so basic thing that we're talking about today is file operations. And to be perfectly clear, a file is a set of data, it's a bunch of bytes, stored on a computer's secondary storage. And that could be a hard drive, that could be an SSD drive, that could be a flash drive on a USB stick or something like that. So something where there's a bunch of bytes being stored that are persistent even when the power of the computer is off. And hopefully it's also a larger storage space, probably much larger than you can store in memory while programs are actually running. So of course, programs can read from files and can write to files. They can read information from the file into your program's variables or send information from your program's variables out to the secondary storage into a file, which we refer to as reading and writing. And this gets used in many, many applications. I mean, to make a long story short, really any real world significant program is going to be doing this. So word processing programs, databases, spreadsheets, the IDEs that we use for our compilers, they all use file handling. Any program that has an open and a save operation in the user interface, well, that's file handling, absolutely. And anything else, uh, computer games uh, have to have the data for the game stored in a file. And when you save a game partway through, that's file handling. Uh, pictures and movies being loaded and music being loaded into a player, that's all file handling too. So really any real world significant program is gonna be doing this and we should know about it ourselves. All right, now one thing to keep in mind as we go through chapter 12 here in the next couple of videos is that there's two primary categories of files that we'll be talking about in, you know, in different days. So the first main category is what we call text files. Now that's where the data is encoded as ASCII text so as to be readable by human beings. And some examples of this in the Windows world would be files that end with an extension of .txt or .csv or .htm, or .cpp. These are all text type files. And just very briefly, if you didn't know what some of those were, so a CSV file is a comma separated values file, which is kind of an easy way to, to um, send around spreadsheets. There's lots of programs and there's lots of websites that deliver data as CSV files nowadays. For example, Blackboard does that. When I download information from the Blackboard Learning Management System, I get it in a CSV format. Uh, my bank does that, as a matter of fact. So lots and lots of websites send information around like CSVs now. HTM, HTM stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and that's the format that web pages are delivered in. And of course, we all know CPP files, they are the source code files for C++, and we're very familiar with those at this point, of course. Many other, you know, many other examples of text files, but there's just a couple. So the point here is that for those types of files, the information has been stored as a bunch of ASCII characters, and therefore you can read them as a human being in a text editor like Notepad, or like our Dev C++ IDE or other IDEs, for example. 
So that's more or less the first half of chapter 12, and we'll be discussing handling text files in sections 12.1 to 12.6. But the other type of file, if it's not a text file, then you're talking about a binary file. And binary files are where your data has been encoded in just the raw binary format, the same format that it's sitting in your variables in your program, and that makes it more efficient for the reading and the writing and the storage on the secondary storage purposes. And we'll talk more about that later. But some examples like this are you know, basically anything else. So a .jpg image file, a .mp3 music file, a .mov movie file, or of course, a .exe executable file on Windows that's storing machine code that actually represents a program. Those are all examples of binary files. If you try to load any of those up in Notepad or something like that, it's just going to look like a random, a bunch of random garbage because they're not designed to be human readable. For those kinds of, for any one of those kinds of binary files, you're going to need some specialized viewer specific for that format. So for image files like JPEG or GIF or BMP or PNG or stuff like that, you need an image viewer that knows how to deal with those particular formats. If you're going to run a movie file, you need a movie viewer that knows about that format. So you would need to sync up a particular type of viewer that knows about that kind of binary format in order to make use of it. There's also, a, there's also programs that are called hex editors that will load up any type of program, but it just shows you the individual bytes. And sometimes programmers use those. So that's more or less the second half of chapter 12. It's sections 12.7, 12.8. So we'll be talking about that uh, a couple of videos from now. For today and the next video, we're talking about text files. Hopefully a little bit easier because, again, as human beings, we can just naturally read them in Notepad. All right, so this slide's about uh, some conceptual stuff as we get started. So first of all, um, we C++ and C and other languages use the concept of a stream of data to make it to simplify any set of, set of data that can do sequential input-output. And what that is doing for us, what that idea is doing for us, is that it's abstracting away a lot of details about how the hardware works so that we can treat the keyboard or the monitor or files on the hard drive or network sockets. We can treat all of those things basically the same. Now, obviously, those are all very different types of hardware, right? A keyboard and a monitor and a hard drive are very, very different types of hardware. And at a low level, you know, some other programmer had to deal with making that fundamentally work. But for us, working in a high-level language like C++, once you get it connected up, all of this stuff acts like just a stream of bytes. So, uh, so uh, for input devices, it's a stream of bytes coming into my program. And for output devices, it's a stream of bytes flowing out of my program over to that device. So it's very nice that we have this high level idea of just like it's a stream of bytes coming in, it's a stream of bytes going out, and that's more or less all you have to think about. And once you learn how to do that for one of these things in C++, it'll work exactly the same for all these other things. Now, fortunately, just as one example, we know how to get information in from the keyboard already with the sin object. And that idea is gonna transfer over immediately to dealing with files or other things. So that's very nice. Now, once we've got that idea of a data stream in our head, what that's literally going to look like in C++ is that in C++, we use the object-oriented paradigm for streams. And, you know, objects or really classes is the, the big idea of this second semester of programming. That's the main subject of the next chapter, chapter 13. But to make a long story short, the idea behind objects is that like structs contain data, well, objects also contain data plus functions. So these objects contain data in them, and they also contain functions inside of them, kind of the same way. And that's kind of the big idea behind what's called object-oriented programming. So when you have an object that contains both data and functions, you're gonna be calling those functions with a bunch of syntax that looks like this. You're gonna be naming the object and then dot and then the name of the function, and then of course parentheses and whatever parameters go into the function like that. So whereas in the prior chapter with structs, we were naming the struct dot a member piece of data. For objects, we name the object and a dot and then name the function that you want to have happen. 
So we'll be seeing more about that in the next chapter, chapter 13, where we'll get to design our own objects, however we like. But I don't mind the fact that here in chapter 12, we're doing a couple separate things. One, we're learning how to deal with file handling and you know storing a whole bunch of information efficiently on the hard drive. But we're also getting some practice just using objects because in C++, that's how the file handling was set up. So we're kind of serving multiple purposes at once, which is great. Okay, so be on the lookout for a whole bunch of object.function type stuff. That's what object-oriented programming winds up looking like. All right, so once you've got those basic ideas in your head, here's how we're literally gonna do that in C++. So when you're using files, you're gonna need four steps or four phases to it. Item number one, you've got to declare an object which is a lot like declaring a struct or a variable, really. So there's three different types of objects for file handling, and these all exist in the fstream header file. So whichever one you're using, you have to do pound include bracket fstream for file streams is what that stands for. And the three options there is there is an object of type called ifstream for an input file stream. And that's only for input, for information coming from the hard drive into your program. Second, there's the OF stream data type, and that stands for output file stream. So for information coming from your program, variables being sent over to a file on the hard drive. And then there's an object that's just called F stream for file streams that can actually do both. Now, for what it's worth, back in chapter five, we were just focused on IF stream, OF streams, which are dedicated to one or the other. Here in chapter 12, we're probably going to spend more time on the F stream type that's kind of more flexible and can do both and a little bit more advanced, uh, but we left it until this chapter here. So you're going to declare an object of one of those types, whatever you want to do with it. Item number two, you actually have to open the file and attach it to the physical file on the disk or the flash memory or whatever it is. So what you do that is the function's name is open. Every file object has a function inside it called open. So whatever you called the file object, you're going you're gonna to name file dot and then open. And inside those parentheses, you have to put the file name, which could be mydata.txt, or it could be uh, last Wednesday's image.jpg, something like that. So a standard file name as the parameter to your open function. Now, once you've opened the file and you've got your variables connected to the hard drive like that, then here's the, here's the neat thing, at least for text files, you can use the right arrow extractor operator or the left arrow insertion operator to read from or write to a text file just like you do with sin and count. That's great. Sin and count are literally data streams just like your files are data streams. So if you know about the left arrow and the right arrow for sin and count, it literally works absolutely identical for text files. And that's great. I think that was very smart for C++ to set it up like that. So all your knowledge about that just instantly transfers over because they're literally the same kind of thing. And then once you've done your reading, once you've done your writing to that piece of information, then at the end, you need to close the file and the function is called close that's in your file object. So you're gonna write file, whatever the name of your object is, dot close, empty parentheses. You don't put anything in those parentheses. Um, and then what happens is your operating system closes the file, flushes any intermediary buffers that it was temporarily storing information in, and also releases a lock on the file that it uses to prevent multiple programs from overwriting each other. So if you don't do file.close, particularly on an output file, the file will still be locked and other programs won't be able to ever access it. So make sure you actually you know, do that close operation, probably about the last thing in your program, I would imagine. Okay, so there's four things, as usual, declare some data, in this case, file stream objects, and then you have to open it, read or write it, and then close it at the end. So hopefully that's pretty easy to remember. Let's dig into a little bit more detail about that. Now, um, again, three types of file stream objects. The first two are a little bit easier to deal with, frankly. The IF stream, remember that's for input file stream. You can only, uh, you can only open a file for input there. It just automatically opens a file purely for reading from the file into your program. The file cannot be written to with an IF stream type object. 
and the open function is going to fail if the file doesn't already exist on the hard drive, which makes sense. Um, so we'll show you how to um, um, uh, error handle that, you know, validate, make sure that it actually did open successfully. Otherwise, you can put up an error message or something like that. On the other hand, this OF stream object, again, an output file stream, is dedicated for output only. So when you open that, that kind of file, you can only write data to it. You cannot read it back from that type of object. Now, that's actually a little bit more powerful. When you do an OF stream open operation, that actually makes a new file on your drive, on your disk. Um, if it wasn't there before, now it's created, just made a new thing. Now you can start writing information to it. And you want to be a little bit careful because if there was already a file of that name, it just got erased. So you just made a new file, wiped out anything that had that name before, and uh, now you have an empty file available for writing information to. So be a little bit careful and make sure that you actually intend to make a new file um, with your OF stream open operation uh, because you could uh, totally wipe out some data if you didn't intend it uh, to, to work like that. Now, these two objects, IF stream and OF stream, that's what we mostly focused on back in chapter five. So if you wanna see more detail about that, again, go look at the chapter five lectures. Probably for the rest of this chapter, we're just gonna focus on the F stream object. So let's get into that. Okay, the F stream object. And if you're you know, one of my students in first semester programming, Again, we did the chapter five stuff and we said, we're gonna hold off F streams until the advanced file handling in chapter 12 and now we're finally here. So the F stream object can be used for either input or output. Um, and when you open it, you're gonna give a, a mode specification for whether you wanna open it for input or output or both. And you get to choose about that. So the F stream uh, library, the Fstream header, gives you access to a couple of these special codes in the iOS namespace. So again, as usual, iOS means input-output system. So there's this code iOS colon colon in, which indicates you want your file stream to be open for input. Again, information from the drive into your program. And then there's iOS colon colon out, which tells your file stream that I also want you to do output again, from your program out to the hard drive. So to be clear, iOS, input-output system, that's a namespace. The double colon here is called the scope resolution operator, and then in is an actual constant in that namespace. So hopefully you remember, like with sin and count, if you don't do using namespace STD, like we do in this class a lot, you would have had to be writing STD colon colon sin and std colon colon count, that's really the full name of those objects. So here, doing some file handling, we might as well use the full name here and kind of get used to looking at that. Um, so here's an example of that. So I've made an fstream object, presumably, and called it dfile, probably for a data file, I'm guessing. So to open that, I'd write dfile.open, and then for the parameters, I'd specify the name of the file that I want to make here, I'm making a new file here for output, class.text, and here I'm passing in both of those mode codes, the iOS in, also the iOS out, and they're being combined with the pipe operator, again, that's the straight bar above the enter key, that's technically called the bitwise or operator, the bitwise or operator. So this iOS in is really a particular bit in an integer, and the iOS out is also one specific bit in an integer, and the bitwise or operator combines them together. So now you've got both of those bits in that integer, and that's actually how that works. You might consider, if you're interested in exactly the functioning of that bitwise or operator here, you might consider reading the digital appendix I, which has more information about binary numbers and individual bits and what's called bitwise operators that we're using here. But um, for, for this perspective here, you can just consider this as, this is how I combine together multiple mode bits. So if I do want to open a file that can do both input and input output, this is what I would do. All right, so here is the first example in chapter 12, pretty simple program. This program uses an fstream object to write data to a file. So we had to include the fstream library. Uh, pro the main function uh, starts up here, and of course, data declaration is the very first thing. We are making an fstream object 
and calling it data file. So the type is fstream and the identifier is data file. Again, gonna write that camel case like we normally do. So line 10 is gonna to print to the monitor. See line 10 is using count like we normally do and it's printing opening file just to tell the user that something's happening here. And then line 11, you're opening the file. So there's data file dot open demo file dot text. So again, may, since this is being opened for output, as you can see the very last tag here, where we put in iOS colon colon out, that's gonna make a new file on the hard drive called demo file dot text for the first time. And then another piece of information to the monitor, now writing data to the file. And then lines 13 through 16, that's really the new thing here. We're sending information out, not to count, but to our data file. So data file gets Jones with a new line printed to it. And then it gets Smith with a new line printed to it. And then Willis and then Davis, each of them with a new line so that they show up on different lines when you look at this. Okay, so there's all the writing, all the output. And then we're done with that. And we call data file dot close, nothing in the parentheses there. And that closes the file. And now it actually has all that information sitting on the hard drive. And then again, to keep the user informed, we print done to the screen. So a fairly simple initial example of writing information to an output file. Back in chapter five, there was a very similar program. Um, and instead of, instead of using the fstream object, it was using the ofstream object, which takes care of this iOS out mode automatically for us. Uh, but we should test this. Okay, so to test this, what I've done is I've made a dedicated folder on my desktop. I've gotten the code for uh, program 12.1 out of the book lecture code and just put it here to begin with. Generally speaking in the course, we're gonna be dealing with more and more files as part of one particular program going forward. So it's really smart to keep things organized and make a dedicated folder to store all the source code and the executables and the object files and the, de the, the data files for one particular application and that's what I'm starting to do here. So you should probably do the same thing if, if you don't already do this. So I'll open up this program in uh, our DevC++ IDE as usual and um, complete program there, I can compile it. Now, keep an eye over in the folder here, and you know, if we're in class and I quiz one of my students, they ought to be able to tell me what's about to show up over here when I compile this. And of course, there's an executable file. That's the whole point of compiling, it's always the whole point. So now I've got pr12.1.exe in that folder, and now I can actually run this, and remember, this here is a program to write information to a new file on the hard drive. So again, keep an eye on that folder and see what happens now when I run this program. You see that? So it just made a new file called demofile.txt. That is what this line 11 is doing. It opens a file and creates a new output file when you do that. I'm just gonna bring my console on screen here. It showed up on my other monitor. So what got on the console was you know, telling the user, opening file, now writing data to the file, done. And those are all those count lines in this program. But the really interesting thing, the real purpose of this program was to write those names into the data file. And now I'm just gonna go open that in Notepad and yep, that got into that file. So now I have a new text file with the, those names, Joan Smith, Willis Davis, and that's what this program does. So pretty good example of writing to an output file. You can just open the file and then use the insertion operator just like you do with count. And then it's going to that file instead. Nice. Okay, so here's some other uh, options here when you're doing file handling is in that example, we had separate lines for declaring the, the fstream object versus opening the fstream object. Well, you can combine those both at once, kind of like you're initializing a variable. So you could declare an ifstream object, name it grade list, and then immediately put down parentheses with the file name, and it will um, initialize it and immediately connect it to that particular file on the hard drive. So you could do both the declaration and the opening at once. That's, that'll save you some time. Now remember, for particularly for input files, um, I mean, this could happen for either type of file, but particularly for input files, if the file that you're asking for doesn't actually exist, or maybe it's locked down or for some security purposes or something, if you don't 
manage to successfully open the file, you ought to validate that check, whether the file was actually open before you try to read from it. And the member function, remember member functions inside the objects, kind of like data in a struct, there's a member function called fail that will return true if the opening failed or false if it was actually okay. So you could have a validation line that checks on that and write if grade list dot fail, if that's true, then apparently you failed to open it and you can throw up an error message and skip the processing that you were trying to do. Or alternatively, here's a second way of doing the exact same thing is the not operator also does the same thing. So I could actually just write if not grade list, which to my mind makes sense because it's saying if I don't have the grade list available, then here comes an error message. So, you know, consider, you know, both of these wind up doing the exact same thing. Again, having the not operator do this job is called overloading. That We'll talk more about how we can make that happen in a future chapter. So you could pick either one here. Uh, maybe the grade list dot fail uh, is more readable to you or more clear about what's happening. Maybe you like the fact that the second one is shorter. Uh, probably me, I would probably do the second one. But for, for my students, feel free to use either one that's more understandable or more obvious to you. And, you know, all, all this stuff you should probably jot down before we have our next lab session, because certainly we'll have to do at least one or the other in our next lab. All right, so thinking about the input issue here, uh, you have a file that's probably got a whole lot of data in it. I might not even know how much data is in there. The whole idea here is there's a bunch of data and we ought to be able to automatically read all of it in without the user having to type it in. So the really nifty thing is that that stream extraction operator, the, the right double angle brackets there that we normally use with sin, but now we're using, we're about to use with files now. In addition to reading one piece of text data into a variable, this operator also has a return value that's either true or false. It returns true if you did successfully read a value into your variable, or it returns false if it did not su successfully do that. For example, if you've read all the information in your file, you hit the end, which is referred to as the end of file, or EOF for short, and once you hit the end, you can't read any more data, because there isn't any more data. So if you attempt to extract more data out, this thing here returns false. So as a result, it's gonna be really efficient to use that operation in the middle of a while loop. So you can test that in a while loop controller to continue execution as long as values are available to be read from the file. So I'd probably write something like this, like while input file, which presumably has already been opened, write arrow into an integer variable number. Presumably my text file just has a whole bunch of integer numbers in it. So what, when you hit this line, what's gonna happen is you're gonna read the first thing into this number variable, and this returns true. So the while loop enters its body and it does whatever processing you need to do, calculation or printing or whatever. And then you come back and you hit this again and you go to the file and you read out, I guess, the next number into this variable and you return true. And then you go into the body and you do your processing. And if you come back at some point and it tries to do this, but there's no more data in the file, then you get false and the while loop ends. And at that point, you've actually read everything in the entire file automatically. So that's pretty convenient. Now there's a second way to structure your loops like this that some people prefer, like particularly if people don't like to see that right arrow extract or they might do this instead. You can read one item before the loop. So, okay, so before you get to the while loop, read the first item into a variable. And then here's this function, this member function called EOF that checks, have I hit the end of the file. So EOF, or EOF returns true if you are at the end of the file and it returns false if there's more stuff yet to go. So you could try to read one thing and then check this while I'm not at the end of my file, I guess I have more stuff, I can go into this loop and read another piece of input and then process that. Okay, so again, before the loop, you read one piece of information and do something with it and then as long as you're not at the end of the file, do it again and do it again and do it again. At some point you'll hit the end of the file, EOF returns true, so not true is false, and then you're out of the loop and you're done. So again, for my students, I'd recommend write down both of these. 
In the next lab, we're gonna to have to use one of them and the code is structured already expecting either one or the other and we're gonna to have to detect which one it, it, it wants us to use in that lab. Okay, so be ready for both. You, again, as, as, a, as a programmer, you're gonna be reading other people's code a lot and you should be prepared to see either technique and know what's happening with it. So um, here's an example of a loop reading all the information out of a file. And for this, I actually did go back to chapter five. So this is program 522 uh, that gives an example of this. This program reads data from a file. Again, including the upstream library, of course. So here they're declaring a file object of type ifstream. Again, that's dedicated just for input file streams and they're calling it input file. We could have made that an fstream object and open it specifically for input with ios colon colon in. But here back in chapter five, they just made it an ifstream object. Here is a variable called number like we were expecting to hold one piece of incoming information. Uh, we're opening the file line 12. So here's input file dot open list of numbers dot text. Now for this to work, there has to be a pre-existing file called list of numbers dot text in the directory in the folder with my executable for this to work. So any file handling object, by default, it looks in the same directory as the executable. So make sure that your executable is in the same place as your data file, otherwise this isn't gonna work properly. But if it is, then line 12 is gonna connect it up, the file will be open. And then the thing we're really focused on here is line 16. Here's this while loop that's gonna read all the information in the entire file one after the other. So just like we were saying, you get here and you try to read one number into that variable. And if that's successful, it returns true. And you get to line 18. And for this very simple program, you just print it out of the screen. And then you go back to line 16, read in another number to that variable, right? If that works, if there's actually something successfully read, you're on line 18, you print it out. At some point you come back to line 16, you're at the end of the file, the reading operation fails with false, and then you're out of the while loop, you're down on line 22, the file gets closed, um, and the program's over. So again, pretty, pretty efficient way here that we have of reading all the data in a file one after the other. And of course, the computer's gonna do this so quickly, it just looks like the whole thing's instantaneous, but it is, as always, one single step on the CPU after another. We, we should test this as well. Okay, so here I've made a dedicated folder for this program. I've gone back to chapter five and I've got program 522 that we're looking at, put it here. And in addition, I've also got the data file that's in the book's code archive called list of numbers.txt. I've put it in the same location, the same folder. If that's not there, this program isn't gonna work properly. So let's open this up. Great, again, this needs to have list of numbers.txt in the same place as the program by which I mean the executable. We need the executable, so I'll compile this. All right, so now I've got pr522.exe. Now I can actually run that. I suppose we should actually maybe look in that file and see what's already there. So what is in list of numbers.txt? Okay, well, there's a list of numbers. So it's 100, 200, 300, up to 700. That's the contents of that text file. Again, very easy. I can just load it up in Notepad and just read it as a human. Uh, so now I'll run this. And that's what it does. It reads all of that information out of the file and throws it up in my console. Now again, those were actually read one at a time. So you got the line 16, you read in 100 and printed that, and you came back, and then you read in the 200 and printed that. And at some point it got down to the end, after the 700 was printed, tried to read again, this attempt failed, and that's how the while loop ended, and then you closed the file and you had all of that data in my console. Of course, you know, I could have done something else. I could have computed it, I could have kept a total, I could have computed an average, but the point is that's how all the information gets into my program. So a pretty good example there too. So that example was about file input, obviously, information coming from the hard drive into our program. And before that, we already saw a file output. You can just use the left arrow to send information in text form to your file, just like you do with Kout. And so to give some additional detail on that theme, you can also use any of the IO manipulation functions that you use with Kout. The stuff that comes out of the IO manip library, like show point or set W, set width to, to line up tables, 
uh, or set precision to set the number of decimal places you want to see in floating point numbers when they get printed. However they work with count, they work exactly the same for output text files. And that makes sense because they're both literally the same kind of thing. They're both output data streams. So whatever works for count works exactly the same for output text files. And how great is that? All of your knowledge that you have about the IO manip functions immediately transfers over. And it's very smart for our programming language to be set up this way so that you can more quickly bootstrap your prior knowledge and get started with new tasks like file handling and nicely formatting your output text files. So you already know how to do that. How great is that? All right, so at this point, uh, my students and I would get together for a lab um, trying out uh, file handling maybe for the first time for some of my students. So I'd go into lab 12 folder, I'd get this files.cpp program, and we would actually make our own data file for this first one. So we would actually make, we'd probably load up um, Notepad on Windows, type in this data, store it as a text file, and you can give it any extension you want. So the way this program is set up is it expects the file to be named payroll.dat. And a lot of our files will be named .dat for data. Uh, but again, it's just a text file that we can open up in any kind of text editor like Notepad. And so this information here for a number of people uh, it represents their pay rate, um, their hours worked. I guess it's I guess it's really um, hours worked first, and then the pay rate, and then the state tax rate, which here would be five percent, and the federal tax rate, and this is representing twelve percent here. So for a bunch of different people in a bunch of different uh, di bunch of different states or tax brackets potentially, and um, you know just to you know in the future probably the the programs will just give that to us uh, already. But for this first one, it's good to just kind of practice making our own text data file. And then we'll have to fill in the code to read in all that data in a loop, I'm sure, do the calculations to compute the, um, the gross and the net pay after withholding for taxes for any number of employees. And that's really nice. So now, once you make the text file once, you can test your program over and over and over again. And the program is just going to read all that information in automatically instantly and we don't have to do a bunch of typing for our testing anymore and that's great so um, hopefully you've got some notes about what we talked about in this introduction to files and if you've already seen some of this in chapter five some of this will be review which is all great so next time we can go on to slightly more sophisticated things like sending file objects into and out of functions so we can keep our programs nice and modular and have our functions do one single thing and also working with multiple files at once, you can totally do that. Those types of programs are called file filter type programs. So we should definitely know about that. And then we can structure our programs better in a more sophisticated way. So I hope you'll join me for that and I'll see you then.